have we actually mentioned the curse on the show show? I don't know if we have, but we we should. We can. <laughs> we have killed um how many? Too many? At least 3. More than that. I feel like it's more than that. Oh, tabs not spaces. That's one of them. Oh man, and that was on Yast Queen too. Well, no, Linux headlines is not still a thing. Oh, it's oh, that's right. That's their Linux action news now, right? Mm hmm. Yeah, so Linux headlines, that's one. Oh uh, my god. All right. Tabs so on the spaces, that's another one. Linux user Ubuntu space. podcast, that's gone. Oh yeah. Okay, I think that's all we've killed. Yeah, and then the most recent uh yeah. How funny. We're still on it, Dan. We still have the kiss of death. That's that's a lot. <laughs> Coming up in this episode, Internet Woes Part D, knocking them over one at a time. Angry Bird site? Knock, knock. What's the password? Uh, we get the explanation. Hello, and welcome to Season 3, Episode 11 of Linux User Space. I'm Dan. And I'm the Leo that almost wasn't. Ugh, man. Internet, Dan. We kind of need it for the show, you know? We do this interaction bit, and it's fairly important if we, you know, the internet piece of that. I need it. I need it. So it was the very first episode that we that we ever did uh, of season three that yep. we had to call it off um, the our normal recording day. Yeah. Because my internet had just been off. Like it. Uh, so normally we record on a Tuesday. And Monday, internet spotty. Tuesday, internet's just gone, and just can't, just can't. So I call, you know, obviously I call the ISP, try to figure things out, and they don't really believe me. <laughs> <laughs> Have you tried right. turning it off and back on again? Oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I have. Um, and. Right, so that doesn't that doesn't go really far, but my complaint is lodged, and uh, but there is no outage in my area. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, things. Uh, and, and this was, by the way, this was by this was during that heat wave right. that was like killing everything left and right, and just giving all kinds of issues and stuff. Well, now we're on the other end of it. Now, uh, where I am in Texas, we have seen sub uh, sub freezing temperatures mm -hmm. right we've yep. in the high tw high 20s in fahrenheit which is negative two three ish, ish right yeah yeah mm -hmm. something like that in celsius so you know for you uh for you celsius folks metric folks and apparently just extreme temperatures mm -hmm. too extremely hot too extremely cold my internet dies and this time though uh it's been pretty spotty um it was Two nights ago, so it was Monday night. Yep. That the internet was just um gone. I, I think I tested it and I was getting 0. 0.7 megabits Whoa. down. And just for context, I pay for a gigabit. <laughs> so less than one percent of what I'm paying for, right? Yikes. I get you know, if if it's a high congest day, uh whatever, and I'm getting five hundred, I'm fine. It's fine. I really don't need the full gig. I, I I have it just in case I need it, right? Right. But uh yeah, point seven not really acceptable. So No. So no. the next the next morning I call in because I work from home too, um, at least currently. And it's kind of important. I kind of need internet to be able to get to yeah. everything. So uh, so I call in. They believe me this time. Uh, after Okay, because what I had done, and I explained this to the guy on the phone, um, is to isolate out any of the equipment that I've got uh, or any, any of the cables that might be, you know, chewed up by squirrels or something around the house or whatever. I just unplug their coax cable from my house. I walk my modem outside 
and let it dangle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I I plugged directly into their cable and still not I think I think I tested it a bunch of times. The best I got at the time was seven megs. No oh, jeez. So I know it's not I know it's not me. Anyway, so I tell this to the guy on the phone. I've I've unplugged and plugged and redone and redone and rebooted everything. And uh, anyway, long story short, he believes me. They send a guy out um, today. And by the way, we skipped recording day yesterday, so that mm -hmm. makes today Wednesday. Wednesday, yeah. And uh, the guy came out today. the The time frame was 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Oh, so descriptive. I'm so glad they gave me that window of time because. I would not have known when they were going to be here otherwise. <laughs> Great. It's fine. It's fine. But uh, so he shows up about one. I see him prop his ladder up on the pole, climbs up the pole, does some magic up there, climbs down the pole, and he's gone. And I was telling Dan before the show, what what I really, uh, if you're, if you're going to not quite get the job done, you could at least give it the Nintendo cartridge treatment. Yeah. Right, just unplug mm -hmm. it for a sec, give it a yeah. little, and then plug it back in. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's that's it, man. You make it make make the internet go off for a minute so that at least I have the placebo effect for a little while. But that didn't happen, so we're just winging it, and hopefully nothing bad happens. The internet's been fairly stable, you know, prior to uh, the guy showing up, but yeah. has been stable even after he left, which is. Okay, okay, yep. but it's we'll, been we'll, we'll go with that. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's been in the fifties today. Now I can't do that Celsius calculation off the top of my head, but I'm just gonna guess ten. Yeah, that's a yeah. um. Yeah, I think yeah, give or take. All right, so not crazy cold, maybe hoodie, right? That's that's kind of what we're dealing with. So so far so good. Um, but yeah, that's ah, man. it's a matter of time before uh, that's gonna catch up with you again, right? I mean, it's, especially it, yep. if it's temperature related. Oh yeah, what the next wild temperature swing that we see? Uh, I will not have the internet, and I can almost guarantee you it's going to happen on a Tuesday, Dan, because it just always happens. It, 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 mm -hmm. <laughs> it lines them up, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and... Uh, and I guarantee, if we change the recording days of the show to like a Wednesday or Thursday or something like that, that's just when it's going to start happening. Yeah, so it's probably better that we keep with Tuesday. Then, if we have to make it slide a little bit, we can we can still still right. have a little cushion as far as time that's that's what i love about tuesday and we've we've had to exercise that um more <laughs> often than i would have liked this season <laughs> but we have yeah. yeah i like i like the tuesday the tuesday is good i don't, I don't want to change the tuesday well on a uh i was gonna say on a happier note but no not. this is not happy <laughs> no no, no. <laughs> we're, we're just we're oh man it's just a train wreck all day so I mean, you've got your woes. Um, I I've cast a curse. I I'm not sure where it went wrong, but um, it's it's you put the candles in the right configuration on your countertop is what happened. Yeah, and every time you light them, I, I gotta <laughs> something happens. I gotta <laughs> rearrange them. Maybe like circle of friends or something. We'll, oh yeah, we'll, we'll fix it. Um, it may be. I'm gonna try that. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> But I these some of these things that I recommend um don't always stick around for as long as we would like. And and I'll say that they may not even last a couple of weeks after I've recommended them sometimes, sadly. Dan <laughs> somehow you have the kiss of death and we have amassed what I have dubbed the Linux user space graveyard. Yeah, jeez. <laughs> We have we have a graveyard now <laughs> of shows, and um, some of them just uh, didn't make it. And as Dan said, like uh, there were a couple of them that after two weeks, yeah, death. <laughs> yeah, gone. <laughs> and I feel really bad for that. I mean, so at the time they were really great things, and I thought they needed some promotion and. Uh, other people said, hey, yeah, I like that one, too. That's been great for me. And then all of a sudden it's gone and everybody's yeah. like it's like ripped right from my heart uh, in you some ways. You fall in love with something mm -hmm. and then. Uh, yeah. So specifically one, the last one. <laughs> yeah. The last in the one. community <laughs> focus was the ransomware files. We we hawked that. We listened to that. We enjoyed that. 
We brought it onto the show to say, hey, maybe y'all will enjoy it too. And then Jeremy Kirk, the host, came out with a tweet. Uh, well, it's a, it was an audio yeah. tweet thing, mm-hmm. podcast episode, whatever. Um, and it said, he said, unfortunately, I have some sad news. After 13 episodes and one guest episode, the project has come to a close. This makes me sad, of course, but I'll be moving on to a new job soon in the cybersecurity field. So, happy for Jeremy. Yeah, I'm glad no, it, that he's moving up and on, but um, sad for anybody that took our advice. And <laughs> we, we even had someone I know um, comment and say, hey, <laughs> thanks for the recommendation. It's been a great show. I've really been enjoying it. So. Uh, Listen, though, there are still some back episodes there. There and, are. And, and they're relevant. So I feel some bit of comfort there in, in, yes. in that. Um, and so, yeah, so go listen to the previous episodes. It, the, even though the podcast was short-lived, as Dan said, there's a bunch of stuff to go listen to. There's a lot mm-hmm. of education to have out there. So go listen to those at least. And, um, yeah, then, then when you get to episode 13, you can feel sad like us. Right. <laughs> and, and and just just for some context, uh, also in the Linux user space graveyard Oof. has uh, Linux headlines. That was one of the the first things we recommended yeah. um, almost immediately following, but not quite was tabs, not spaces. Oh, man. And that <sighs> one was kind of cool because everybody mm. liked it because it was almost not robotic. The because um, it was a it was a reader. It was a software reader. Right. Of a script. Someone curated the script um, right. such that the reader, I think, had had good good luck, if you will. Right, uh, um, right. So, um, but it was really good. And it was a daily thing, a couple of minutes long. You got all the highlights for the day and it, and it got you off to the races. I, I, I love that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, we, we've recommended a couple of other ones too. Um, the Sans Internet Storm one was uh, is, oh, yeah. is, is is daily as well. So um, there's still some things that are daily that are short that I think are very pertinent. Um, but I miss tabs, not spaces. It was good. I do. I do too. I do too. And then uh, we had one, we had, we had one more in the graveyard. Yep. Yeah. Was the Ubuntu podcast, and um, that one did hang on for a long time after yeah, we it recommended did. it. Um, um, and they did a bunch of seasons too, so it yeah. wasn't like it was a short-lived podcast. Um, a lot of great things, and you can still listen to those back episodes and still have some validity to them as well. I think might yeah. not be quite as pertinent for some of the you know um, current event oh, things, right, but right, right. there's still a, a a lot of other bits to the podcast that are that are good. So the headlines and the tabs, not spaces, that's probably not so great now that. Time has elapsed. Um, right, yeah. Uh, we do have one honorary obituary. <laughs> it's it's not it's not dead, but it's more than just a host change. So we had uh, Biddle, Big Daddy Linux Live, because uh, Rocco stepped away, handed that off to uh, Cubicle Nate, yep. and Nate is now heading. Uh, well, at the time, headed up Big Daddy Linux Live, but then. Yeah, now it it's transitioned. Through... Yeah, its own right natural transition, and now that's Linux Saloon. So yes, so if if you got a time, especially if you're in the U.S., because the times line up way better for you if you're mm-hmm. in uh if, well if you're in the Americas, um then you should yeah. tune in you in the evening times on Saturday, 8 p.m. Eastern. Yes, so you know if you get the chance and you're feeling a little Linuxy on a Saturday night, uh go join them. Or at the very least, go help me harass them in the YouTube chat. <laughs> yeah. Because if I can't make it, you better believe I'm going to be telling somebody they're wrong in the YouTube chat. That's just, I have to. I have to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I I don't make it on the show nearly as much as I used to. I know. For reasons. Uh, but I do try to at least tune into the YouTube uh, stream mostly live uh, but i i almost always catch the episodes um mm-hmm. after the fact so and, and and i like what nate's done with the show it's 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 not a full complete transition but he's got some you know a little bit of a different format to it um, well he's definitely leaned and, and, into the western theme 
Well, he has, but I mean, like he's got some <sighs> themes to the episodes a little bit too. And so he's mm-hmm. got a schedule to that. And so I like you, that. You, you know what you're getting into when you go. Um, I, I, it's, it's, it's good. It's great. I love it. Um, you know, I think, uh, he's got the news flight and he's doing some distro things, but not all the time. And, um, well, you know, and, and he I, oftentimes, tries to line up the distro things with what we're doing here on Linux user yeah, space. So I very much appreciate that. They they can tie together and you can um catch the history here obviously and go over there and talk about your experience. Mhm. And they uh and specifically speaking to that, um they you you will not get this episode before they do it, but right. they're they're running up against uh Kali Linux, which is what we mm-hmm. just finished the history of and our thoughts on. Um, so the episode that will likely be hitting YouTube, not live, but edited, uh, by about the time you hear this will be their Kali Linux, um, Yeah, they're going to come out about the same time, like almost, uh, mm-hmm. lockstep. Yep. So go check that out. Uh, if it's, if it's more people that, that you want to hear about, about Kali, uh, that's, that's what it's going to be. Well, at least that's what the first half of the show mm-hmm. is going to be about. And, uh, you know, they, they always have some good news topics or some general discussion around the Linux uh, area to, to talk about, too. The if, old Linux saloon water cooler. Yeah. yeah you know, <laughs> if you're not interested in trying different distros, you're very happy with where you're at and you don't you feel comfortable there. There's still plenty of other discussion. Oh, of course. Absolutely. And not everybody does the um, distro. Oh, what do they call it? Um Distro journey is something like that. Yeah, not, not everybody participates anymore. in yeah. that, and you don't have to. No, uh, it's just it's welcome for all Linux folk. So absolutely, yeah, it's always a good time. And if you haven't subbed here uh, on our YouTube channel, uh, you can do that now while we have you distracted. Don't forget though, you can watch us live on Twitch the day after an episode drops. Um, Normally, as long as things go as, as planned and internet happens and all of that stuff. <laughs> oh, hopefully, hopefully I'll have this sorted by the time next so, episode hits. So watch for those announcements in, the, in all the social places and uh, you'll, you'll see when we go live. I love our patrons and I know Leo does as well. I almost can't keep up with all the new folks. It's pretty fantastic. Um, I know I, I, I'm skimming through the email today you know, looking for feedback things. And I, I know there was another, another new patron and, um, that just warms my heart every time I read one of those. Every single time. How do they do it? I don't know. But if you like what we're doing here too, you can support us over at patreon.com slash Linux user space. All right, Leo, um, the Fediverse is booming and Twitter is imploding. Who would have thought um, Mm -hmm. Mastodon, Mm -hmm. of all places, uh, becoming the talk of the town? It is so cool. We joined, uh, Mm -hmm. Linux User Space joined back in, I want to say, February ish and I, I say that now and i'm like well, i don't actually know yeah no i think that's when we as the um you know linux user space joined but you and i were joined well before that because we talked about this in season mm-hmm. one episode seven it was one of the later ones 17 See, now- 17 i looked it up oh, okay there so, we go so season one episode 17 which is <laughs> feeling like a while ago now <laughs> a little bit a little um, bit so we've we've been around Mastodon for quite a little bit, and I was on mm-hmm. Mastodon even before that. So, um, yeah, you were the only one of us that already had an account. Yep. Uh, and I say us; it was uh, Joe was still on the show at the time. I think that may have been one of his very last episodes. Yep, I think uh, you're right. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Dan, you had yours already, and that was on Mastodon Technology. You're right. Spe- speaking of graveyard, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm having this kind of crisis right now because I do want to start writing again. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I, and I think I found this like weird history itch that, that I still want to scratch in other ways now too. Um, and I, I don't know if I want to do that 
on Mastodon because I'm not limited by the what is it 280 or something character limit for yeah, some accounts least, on Twitter. It's at least 500 on Mastodon. Right, right. On the instance that we're on, it's 500. But some instances, yeah, more, yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, C.im may have been 1024 or something like yeah, that. Yeah, like it was, I, I want to say a thousand plus. I don't know. Yeah, and and so I'm kind of having this crisis, right? Because I have um my my actual blog at leochavez.org mm -hmm. and then I have now apparently this 500 character blank slate that I know seems to just be in a really nice yeah. and as far as the people that I follow and that follow me, um nerdy little niche in on the internet that mm. huh. I, I so I don't know what to do is, is really what I'm getting at. I, I don't know if I want to post on my blog or on Mastodon or both or neither, or I don't know. Yeah. But I'm, I'm just happy that Mastodon has grown so much Me that too. I'm having this crisis. And I'm like, we're surrounded. I mean, obviously we chose to be, but we're surrounded by people that are very like-minded and interested mm -hmm. in technology, interested in Linux. Um, and so being able to start over, I think, is part of the, the process um, in why it's in, and, and leads to why it's so good, mm -hmm. um, because we're able to curate things the way we want. But in, in addition to that, you have a lot more filtering that's available to you. You can keep it the way you mm -hmm. want and, and go forward that way. Yeah. And, and I like that. I like that a lot. Um, so I guess the, the question is, if you're unhooked from mm -hmm. the internet, uh, if you don't really follow along with the internet drama, Elon Musk took over Twitter yep. approximately two-ish weeks ago, um, started making a lot of changes to the way things were happening, right? The verified check mark is no mm -hmm. longer what it used to be. Now there's the check mark that you can buy, and then now there's like a little underneath your name, there's now an official it literally right. says official underneath what used to be verified. Right. And, you know, and, and not everybody is as terminally online as I am right. to know that that switch has happened. And so, you know, a lot of folks will look at and, and probably for a good long while in the future, will look at that verified badge, just mm -hmm. the one by your username, and just assume that it means what it's always meant. And that that isn't the case. That that is there's not another the case. badge now for that. Um, and so among other things, he's had, um, uh, Twitter fights with oh, his yeah. own employees yeah, on yeah, yeah. Twitter and he, he fired, fired one of his engineers right there, right there on, on the spot in the yeah. tweet. And I'm like, wow, that's really not the place for that. Uh, it's, it's not, it, it really isn't. And you know, it doesn't even matter who's at fault. What, what no. my takeaway from that is mutiny does not look good. Listen, it stayed running all of this time. They must have been doing something right. I mean, <laughs> right? I no, mean... <laughs> they had they had eighty percent of their microservices were redundant and unnecessary, <sighs> and just taking up space. <laughs> they were they were bloat. Yeah, that's what they said. And, and and he thought he'd get rid of those too. And one of them was kind of important. Uh, the two factor. Mm -hmm. authentication of the SMS two factor. So if you right, got right. a a number texted to you to uh, as you were logging in to verify that yep. you know you have the phone number, you are the person, right? Um that just didn't work. I think I think it does work now. We were talking about I, that pre-show. I think so. I think somebody I saw somebody post that, you know, yeah, it might be working again, but yeah, at first it was like, "Hey, if you're logged in, don't log out because you're not going to get back in because this has been disabled and and yeah hopefully you don't need that yeah Ugh. so so that turmoil mm -hmm. all of that turmoil um as as well as i'm sure that's not it but has caused a mass exodus mm -hmm. from twitter and i and i feel pretty confident calling it that because it, it that that is kind of a over the top kind of generalization of what's happening but yeah I feel pretty confident saying that because you have people um, that were massive on Twitter mm -hmm. now popping up on Mastodon. You do. Uh, like Neil Neil Gaiman and uh, George Takei yep. have kind of moved, and I think a lot of their followers have moved with them. Yep. 
a lot of the big big tech companies too like i mean obviously since we said we follow those right but a lot of them have also done some maneuvering there and um that's pretty exciting too because like raspberry pi oh. they have their own oh. instance oh. they have oh. their own instance oh. not just did they move over to mastodon they created an instance which is oh. fantastic just the absolute Okay, I, I, I've said it before out, off of the show, but I need to say it because Raspberry Pi, from the very beginning, doing, I think, exactly what needs to be done as a large member of the open source community yeah. and the open hardware community. You're not wrong. And I think a lot of that is their mission, right? And so they're trying to... They have a lot of ties to education and furthering education and not like, you know, like one laptop per child was a thing. You know, it's sort of like that, but in a, in a different sort of continuation. But then everybody else in the community can also partake. So, yeah, they've got their own instance and that's pretty cool. But also another big tech. At a, at a left field. Never saw this coming. I didn't either. And this one is not just a new instance. This is a new instance that you can join if you want to. And that's Vivaldi. Vivaldi has created mm -hmm. their own social thing. And um, you, as a, you know, a user, can join it too. And, and instead of just existing in the you know, greater universe, they are contributing to it. And giving back... Making it a better place for everyone, I feel like. That's that's what I'm I'm having trouble putting into words. They mm -hmm. they they are going above and beyond what uh what what would even be expected of them right. to do in the greater Fediverse. Yeah. Um, um, they're they're contributing to it as opposed to just being part of it. Yeah, to to use an old term, they're good netizens. I'm I'm pretty proud of those two uh those two companies for doing what they're doing. I mm. like it a lot. I like what I see. And the more that I look into Mastodon, the more that I the, the more people that that join up, uh the more I'm I'm liking it. And one of those things was I really 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 don't like playing the algorithm game. No. And YouTube and Twitter are notorious mm -hmm. for because you didn't play the algorithm game right, because you didn't post at the exact right time on the exact right day with the exact right hashtags, you are just invisible. Yep. I don't want to spend my time doing that. And so if you go back in our timeline mm -hmm. on either of those places, you'll see we, we don't really play that game. And I think... Um, you know, we might suffer a little bit for that in the uh, in the old we, rankings of whatever. Yeah, we probably do. And I don't know that Mastodon is going to solve any discoverability things for us. But what it does do is it sparks a more organic conversation. Um, you know, something that we can have a conversation, I guess, with, with common minded folks. Yeah, well, I, I do think I do think though that it does do that. I do think it gives us way more discoverability because, mm. okay, yes, hashtags matter on Twitter, especially if there's like a bot attached to that that'll retweet stuff right. and get you to a wider audience and all of that. Um, but in Mastodon, hashtags are essential. Yeah, especially now with the upgrades that they've done to the underlying Mastodon APIs and instances and stuff. So uh, hashtags are really starting to matter. Yes, and, and I think um, it's huge because there is no algorithm on Mastodon suppressing or bringing up posts based on followers or anything else. You, you, the way that you become viral on Mastodon is people liking your stuff, not an algorithm right. liking your stuff. And by liking, I mean boosting. Yeah, not not just not just liking. You need to re, you know, toot or boost or whatever we're calling yeah. that. You, right. You need to get it out there in front of everybody. And then 
all of your followers can see the same thing. And then you can say, oh, that guy looks pretty cool. They're following them. And I'm I, I'm interested in that. And I'll, I, I'll click I, there. And, and that is the way you find – that is the discoverability that is available to you on Mastodon. Whereas it's not – it's not some – bot like you said in the background you know feeding that to you yeah yeah and 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 you can uh you can follow a hashtag and i follow linux mm -hmm. uh, obvious obviously yeah that's a good one um <laughs> I've, I've seen so many people say well it's really hard to find people to follow on mm. what what i think what, what you need to do is just follow a hashtag mm -hmm. and guaranteed if if it's any if, if it's a hashtag that is even moderately busy you're gonna find a good 50 to 100 folks to follow yep. in very short order. Yep. Um, and that's how that's how I found out, uh, well, actually, your boost, but I had seen it on the timeline um, following the hashtag Mastodon, uh, mm -hmm. the Vivaldi thing, mm -hmm. which was absolutely fantastic. And same with uh, Raspberry Pi. They, I followed, yep. um, for a little while, I followed the introduction hashtag because oh, yep. 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 new people coming on Mastodon, you want to do an introduction and gain and learn to follow other folks. That's how I found the Raspberry Pi one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a different feel to the same kind of service, and boy, it just feels you put it the the best way I think we could ever put it uh, in the pre show. Dan, you said organic, mm -hmm. and it is because it's you know friends of friends talking about yeah, things, that's it. and and that stuff is what fills up your timeline. And then you follow more people, and they sh they boost more people, and you find more people to follow, and you yeah, get you it. You get kind of sucked in pretty quickly because, you know, some silly one-off toot that I would normally put on Twitter that would get a little bit of traction or something like that just exploded on Mastodon with people talking about what they wanted to talk about, really. Uh, and I think that's that's fun I, I do too i think that's where it is fun is where you you do get into that and it's you know it's the internet rabbit hole thing oh well you of know, course where where you know oh what did it, 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 it and you just got to follow it around but uh, <laughs> um i think that's the that's the fun part i mean and that's why we do what we do uh, it, with the research on the topics that we talk about oftentimes is because we enjoy that following all the breadcrumbs all the way throughout. And, oh, yeah. And you can totally do that with the people you follow on, on Mastodon as well. So I, I really, I really, really, really do love the feel of Mastodon. Maybe that'll change as, mm -hmm. you know, as, as it hits you know, astronomical numbers. So, well, I mean, here, here's a couple of numbers for you. Um, so like okay. 4.6 million. This is like as of last night. So, I mean, it could could be much more. Yeah, so 4.6 million users across 5,700 instances. Wow. That, that's a lot. That's a lot. And that grow, a lot. growing and growing. I, I've got a challenge, though, for the two of us, Leo. Like, so we're, okay. we're, we're really pushing Mastodon, but there are other things in the Fediverse, and we talked about this in our episode um, yes. last, you know, in the first season. One of the challenges I have for you, I haven't even said this out loud yet. Okay. So we're just we're just revealing stuff now. All right. Okay. I'm ready. So two things I want to see us, future us, try to get uh, involved in. Um, number one, I, I want to see us do like PeerTube. So like we talked about Tilvids a couple of times and I I don't know. I think I, I think. I think that's a good good place for us to go. I see a lot of other other things like what we're talking about there, so I think we'll fit in nicely with with that crowd. History's educational, right? Absolutely it is. No, no, All right. No doubt about it. The other thing that I I think I want to see us try that is not nearly as popular though is funk whale which is made for yeah. music sharing, but also podcasts. There's a, it's mm -hmm. like built in. It's like, uh, you know, ragu, it's built in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. 
So I, I, I think, you know, because we do an audio podcast, it kind of makes sense if we've, uh, we publish there too. So why not to yep. either of those things? Why not? Uh, it's just time, <laughs> but yep. I think we can, like, I think we can squeeze it in there. Well, we're definitely looking into it. I'm, I want to look into this. It sounds really cool. Um, I'm really getting excited about this whole Fediverse thing. Cause like I said, it, it feels like the, uh, the internet of yesteryear mm-hmm. and I like that a lot. Me too. So you can catch great topics as they unfold on our subreddit or our news channel on Discord. Uh, LinuxUserspace.show slash Reddit or LinuxUserspace.show slash Discord for both of those things. And we've got, you know, Telegram, Matrix, which is also decentralized. And, oh yeah, Mastodon. We got that. Yeah. We got that one too so come follow all our socials and catch uh, all the great stuff uh, more info linux user space dot show all right leo we got a little bit of feedback here um we do and if this show was not meandering enough we're gonna meander some more <laughs> so um we got a ne- post on reddit um so and it was like I want to hear more from Leo and Dan about password managers. And th- this was by uh, Curtis Tucker, by the way, on Reddit. So if, if you want to add to this discussion, you can do that. Uh, you know, Linux is based on show slash Reddit. Uh, you can go over there. Uh, all of these types of posts are flared with discussion. So yep. you can sort by that just so you can see those kinds of things. Um, jump down in the comments and, uh, you know. Uh, let us know what you what you think about what we're about to talk about. So, right. yeah, keep your suspenders on. Here we go. I got a link to that in the show notes too. If you if you didn't catch all that, so it says about two years ago, I switched to Pass to store and manage my passwords. The machine I set up for it is a one trick pony. It's a Linux appliance. It sits quietly on the back corner of my desk, reliably doing its thing. Says the hardware is a Raspberry Pi with 8 gig of RAM. The distro is Raspberry Pi OS Lite, you know, the Debian 11 Bullseye 64 bit. Um, this is the server version of Raspberry Pi OS. It's command line only, no desktop. So, no. We don't need no stinking desktop. No GUI stuff. He says, I've created a shell script based service and timer to automate the daily backups. That's pretty slick. Um, he says he uses think, sync thing to automatically move backups off the Pi for safekeeping. He says, I don't have a keyboard or monitor connected to the Pi. I normally SSH in from a Mac Mini on my home network. Configuring and using pass on the command line is pretty straightforward and basically a front end for managing a Git repository. No big deal. He says, I found the following article super helpful for the first time i set the whole thing up and it's the definitive guide to the password store for access away from home i've installed pass for ios on my iphone and ipad yeah think of it like uh, the bitwarden app right and then when you log in you pull down your password right. store that's, yep. yeah that's how this is working yep so installation and setup of pass for iOS client on my devices was not a monumental task, however. Um, like most Linuxy things, typos will break stuff and syntax matters. In the command line, you don't say. <laughs> this has gotten me. I was playing around with pass. I just got to be honest here. I was playing around with pass. I, I'm pretty sure I typoed about a million times. <laughs> mm, yeah. <laughs> So he goes on to say, finally, Tailscale is used to securely tunnel into my password server from my mobile devices, in addition to Linux and Mac OS clients. It also has an iOS client available for download. He, here's a cool bit of trivia. Pass is written by Jason Donafeld, the same developer behind WireGuard, the VPN technology by the folks used by the folks at Tailscale. So oh. I, Leo and I both use WireGuard. Um, I love it on our devices. I haven't made the leap to Tailscale yet. Um, 
that is one of the things that's on my list. So I, I think I haven't done it either, and I think it's because of Stockholm syndrome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> WireGuard is not extremely difficult to set up, it is but not. it does nope. take some technical aptitude. And um, you know, I put all that effort in mm-hmm. uh, moving from OpenVPN, which I also set up from scratch, and then moved right. to PyVPN, which was fantastic, and then moved to WireGuard. Right. Which I think PyVPN now does WireGuard, so I could just go back to PyVPN. But anyway, mm-hmm. uh, <clears throat> different conversation. Uh, and TailScale would be the next logical leap yep. if I wanted things to be a little bit easier. Right. Um, and I do I do want things to be easier, but, Same. you know, because I put all that effort in, I feel like, you know, like, you know I should use it because mm-hmm. I, I put so much time into making it work. So, yeah, tail scale is probably the next logical leap, though, because it is so easy to set up. I agree. I think that's where I'm going with it, too. So anyway, that's a different rabbit hole. Um, so I, I do want to talk about password managers um, that I have used. So we have used KeePass at work uh, for a bit. Um, we don't anymore. Um, I'll tell you why. It works quite well but not great in a shared environment. And I, and by that, I mean, sometimes as a team, you need to share those secret things. Right. Um, not your personal stuff, but like shared things as your team. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of tricky and a little bit prone to the database corruption. If things aren't closed quite completely, because it is oh. a database on, on the back end of key pass, it, it is a database, right? So it's its own thing. Um, and if you don't get it closed up, then it doesn't always like work well. So if it was just for yourself, I think KeePass is a great thing. It has a GUI interface, unlike Pass. Um, and you know, I, 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 it's not a bad tool. Um, it does have clients that are available in just about every platform, including a lot of mobile devices in you know iOS, uh Android, it's it's out there. KeePass mm-hmm. is pretty good stuff. Um we have now moved to Bitwarden even at work, um, which is I'll say great in a team environment. It's made to be logged into by multiple people. Mm-hmm. And you set up collections which you can then share with your teams. Um but on top of that, it is open source. And you can self-host it. Our our work environment has like multiple different teams. Some of the collections are shared, you know, amongst multiple teams. Some of them are just individual teams. But then ultimately, you can still have your own individual passwords too. So it gives you that flexibility and freedom to be able to move those things where they need to be. And you've only got one application that you need to use, which is great. Mm-hmm. Um, beyond that, um, I I also have a paid scri- subscription for home, which I use amongst my family so that yes. we can have those things that we need to be able to share. Um, yeah, you know, like <laughs> Netflix. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. I mean, they let you create your own profiles how how do you all log into it if you don't all have the password? The same username and password, Dan, because that's ultimate security. Ah, but so <laughs> it exists and you need to be able to share that amongst everybody. Um so this lets us do that and in, in a in a in a pretty great way. But above and beyond just the password stuff. Bitwarden lets you do TOTP one-time passcodes. Yeah. Like those, you know, little six-digit things that, you know, you want to log into your Reddit, you want to log into your Twitter, you want to log into whatever. Um, it'll do those things too. And that's kind of great. Um, and I I did talk about that when we talked about uh, different TOTP applications that are available for Linux. It was a GNOME one and a KDE one, right? There was. Keysmith and... Oh, it's it's GNOME Authenticator and Keysmith. It was in episode uh, six of season two titled NVMe Catastrophe. There it is. So so if you want to go hear about that episode two, or I'm sorry, episode six, uh, season two, go check that out. And so 
like those things are typically made so that you only use it on one device, but like I'm super paranoid. So I actually take those codes and I put them into the two different applications and then I don't have to worry about if my phone breaks, I won't be able to get into whatever service. Oh yeah. That's, that's a scary um, prospect, right? Cause not everybody is really good and, about keeping your, um, your one time password secure and available yep. and all that kind of thing. You, so you, you yeah. can create the codes and print those off or something and put them in your safe or whatever. Right. Who does that? I don't know. But like I keep, I, I just I, I just know <laughs> that I have to keep a couple of devices very secure and away from people prying, you know, fingertips. Right. And, and and that way I can I can have like it in two places and I feel a lot more comfortable about those things. Oh, that's way faster than digging up the one time passwords and well, you know, yeah. digging into that and decrypting and blah. so I I do use Bitwarden for some of that stuff. The other thing that you can do is you can send encrypted, it has encrypted storage, and you can send encrypted notes or uh, text or whatever to other people that are not I like ne that. Not necessarily Bitwarden users. It, it, it'll, it'll encrypt it and send it, and they can, they can then decrypt it on their end. So if you wanted to send someone a password, for, like, like as a system administrator, you wanted to send them their first time password potentially. You can, oh, you can do that right through this, and then you don't have to worry about it getting, you know, seized in transit. So that's right. kind of nice. Um, those things are cool. I think that's great. In addition to that, like if you're self-hosting, yeah, you can you can do that. Or there is another project called Vault Warden which Leo and I use. Yes. And I, I was waiting for you to get to this get to this part because man, I like it. I like mm -hmm. it so much. It is so useful between uh you know, especially between me and you. Mm -hmm. Uh because, you know, we have all the things. We have like if if there's a service, we probably have a login for it. Right. And that's where that stuff lives. And it's just so easy to be able to get in there, update things that you need, pull out passwords that you need, and just get on with your days. It's, it's very nice to be able to do that. I agree. And so it's pretty much like Bitwarden. It's, it's, it uses the same API. It's a rewrite in Rust. Um, so, I mean, you know, all of those things are ticking some boxes, I want to say. Because <laughs> yeah. Bitwarden itself has been vetted, if you will, by third-party auditors, mm -hmm. and then if you take that and then you write it in Rust, um, you know your code's going to be secure and, and meet meet some marks. So um, you do have to self-host that stuff, and it it's it's not it's 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 not bad though, right? So there's a Docker image you can spin that up, and then you can get started. Um, as long as you're comfortable with that. Yeah. And the cool thing is, right, like you hold your own keys, like mm -hmm. that has nothing to do with the container or anything like that. So, mm -hmm. um, no, it's encrypted. It, it's, it's nice. It's nice. On your machine. Yeah. Right. No. Just as encrypted as Bitwarden would be. Right. right. Yep. Yeah. I love that. Yep. Um, so that's cool. One final application I'm going to talk about, and that's just my personal experience is QT pass. So, in Lubuntu, you'll find Qt Pass as one of the default installed applications. Um, and Qt Pass is a cute, obviously GUI front end for Pass. So if <gasps> really it is. So if you oh. like Pass, Qt Pass will give you all of those great same features and functionality. Only it brings out a nice cute GUI. A cute GUI or a cute GUI? It's a yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. All right. You got okay. me, I know. So <laughs> obviously though, as Q toolkit goes, it's very cross platform and it's available on Windows, Mac, BSD, Linux, all of the places, right? And I feel like that's one of the great things that needs to get highlighted as well. Um, is those things can be cross platform in addition to just Linux. Um, so I, I haven't used it a ton, uh, but I've used it a little bit and it has a great foundation, I feel like, because it's built on tested technology in pass. 
So I, I can't I can't go too terribly far into mm-hmm. past because there's there's more. There's mm-hmm. more to come. Stay tuned. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um but I, I do have to say that uh past was fun. It it took me back to basics. Mm-hmm. I had forgotten how much I like to be in the command line to do administrative type yeah. work. And pass is absolutely one of those kinds of things. So I, I have to say, um, Curtis, thanks for yes, uh, yes for, for asking for this, for, for yeah. writing about this, because um, it kind of turned me on to something I didn't know I needed, that I didn't know that I absolutely had to have in my life. So and and like you, I've got uh, I've got an iPhone, um, so pass for iOS is going to be mm-hmm. really cool. Dan, I I was very sad to learn that the pass for win mm-hmm. uh, project hosted at GitHub had died back in 2016, and it was the only Windows specific application. But I absolutely forgot how cool Qt was. Mm-hmm. And the fact that it's just cross-platform, that you can use it wherever you want to use it. That yep. is amazing about that. So, Oh, I just... got one more final one that I didn't even put in the notes. But Oh. So we, oh. we, we, we gave a lot of props to Bitwarden, right? Um, Bitwarden has obvi- – it's obviously a web client. But there is an application that you can install, the app image or um, mm-hmm. Snap mm-hmm. or Flatpak, whatever. But – like you, you said you love the command line. There is a command there line is. application for Bitwarden if you if you so choose. And and I think more more so more so than just specifically pass because again we'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, I like the solution that you've put together. Essentially, doing what Bitwarden does for you, but you've yep. rolled your own. Uh, what what Curtis wrote about it is one of my favorite things to read because it's stuff that I've obviously never thought about uh, myself. But now when I read it all put together, mm. all you know the Lego schematics are given to me. It makes so much sense, and I I really enjoy this solution. It yeah. is really cool. So much so um, that I dove into Pass myself. Mm. And um, but 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 we're gonna save oh. that for a minute. I'm gonna hang on. I'm gonna hang on to that a little bit. So, Curtis, stick around. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there, there will be more. So, I'm gonna give you my bottom line. Um, it, it's really, really important to have something, something as a password manager. I feel like, especially now, you need passwords that are unique and you know, kind of difficult, complicated. Mostly long. I, I think long, I think long, length of your password is probably you know, grants like, more entropy than anything else. I think Just, all of those things together though are really important. But be, they are. beyond that, beyond that, the password is only the first line of defense. Make sure that for the services that offer it, you are using two factor authentication or multi factor authentication if it is available. Don't. And, and there's a lot of talk about you know don't don't do SMS or whatever type yeah. of two factor any two any factor is authentication better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. is better than no two factor authentication. I agree with so, that. So you know if if that's all you've got, if only phone uh, SMS two factor is all you got, use it anyway because yeah. it is extremely important to do so. Yeah, don't don't rely totally on the password itself though. Um, yeah, use something else in addition yeah and i think even even google has decided we're moving on yeah they from did. from passwords and a yeah. lot of that work has so, already been done and we're we're inching to a day i don't know if passwords passwords will ever be gone forever but we're we're definitely inching to a um to a situation where passwords are taking a back seat to everything mm-hmm. else um the next up is a, a mastodon post actually Surprise. This is from Paul. Paul writes, I've listened to parts of a few episodes of Linux User Space podcast about Mastodon, Linux text editors. He says, I came to Emacs first, but learned Vim from my day job. So, Don't blame you. Well, that use what you gotta, but I like Vim. Anyway, the hosts are really easy to listen to. 
what I realized is that they're fans of Linux. Oh, yes. Um, so he says, I realized I'm not really a fan. I get paid to be a Linux sysadmin, but I, and I much prefer using Linux in that capacity to anything else, but it's a professional tool to me. Huh. Instead, I'm a fan of Apple products. Okay, he goes on to write, don't get me wrong, I think Linux is a cool technology. I first worked with Unix back in 1989 when I worked for Xerox at El Segundo. We got a Sun 3 server and some Spark Station 1Ss. I was a programmer, but I read about Unix in college, so I relished a chance to learn more about it. We had multiple yards of Sun manuals. I read through them and became our de facto sysadmin. Yeah, like everybody else. I mean, a lot of people, <laughs> know, right? anybody that read the manual was like leaps and bounds. You were the guy. You, you become the, guy. the guru. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you read the manual, man. You yep. did it to yourself. <laughs> I was guilty too. I mean, I I enjoy that type of reading. And uh, well, obviously, that's where, that's why we landed uh, where that, we are. <laughs> well, yeah, that's why we are where we are. We've done it to ourselves and mm -hmm. well. Now we just do a podcast about it because we ain't got nothing better to do. <laughs> yeah. He says, that was the last job where I was paid to be a programmer. Uh, so I, I wrote Paul back and, and indicated that I thought it was a great topic and I thought we should include it into the show. And so I hoped he would keep listening. I, and I think that's a, that's a perfectly fine way to mm -hmm. use Linux. There is no right way no. to use Linux. The only right way to use Linux is to use Linux. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter how big or how small or how grand or what desktop or anything. If the only thing that you use mm. Linux for is to run pass on a Raspberry Pi with sync thing on it, that's perfectly that's fine. Cool. That's cool. If <laughs> all of your other devices in your entire house or entire circle of friends isn't Linux, cool. That's fine because that's I think originally that's that's really what Linux was meant to be, just a tinkering platform. And then mm -hmm. all these folks came in and said, We like that, we'll build on top of that. Right. Cool. Right. And so whatever capacity you use it in, that that is the right capacity. I agree. Um and using Apple everywhere else, okay. I use Apple a lot for work. Um I it's still one of the most premium feeling laptops I've ever held in my hand ever, mm -hmm. and and this, not not any particular year model either. They they all okay. Twenty eighteen keyboard was terrible, but mm -hmm. you know in general though, um, there's a lot of good to be had in that, and it still sits on top of Unix, so you can still get your nerd cred on. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, and I mean, no matter how much Windows you use, you know. That's okay too. So that's absolutely fantastic. I'm I'm more interested in your history in '89 yeah. with uh, with with the Unix and the the Spark Station One that you used. And mm, mm. I, I'm mm, those were good there, times. There's, there's a good chance I'm going to ask you about that stuff. <laughs> I, I didn't. I yeah. So I don't have the same professional experience that you, that you you had there. But I was computing around the same time so i'm really familiar with like how exciting that was oh you man know, during that i wish time. Mm -hmm. my 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 experience started around 95 mm -hmm. um man but but so much like especially digging into the history now i i look back and i'm like man how cool would it have been to be a fly on the wall in the insert whatever lab you're talking about or whatever company you're talking about because some of that stuff just sounds so cool. So yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. I just, I'm just happy to compute, I think. <laughs> well, the same, like I, I'm, I'm, I'm there too. Um, we also have a fair number of Macs on our campus um, that I work at because we have artists of both music and you know visual art uh, yeah so both of those programs use their share um my daughter who is an artist um i bought her a mac that's you know like but she also has a windows desktop so she has both 
Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, it's, I think it's really cool to just use it all. Yeah, I, I think and, that's that's well. She's a consumer of both. She consumes it yeah. all, and she uses the Windows desktop for gaming. Um, yeah. and and but so yeah. you know whatever. I've I've got all three in my circle. I mean, Windows for gaming, Mac mm-hmm. for work, Linux for everything else. Yep, and I I think it it it's just a really cool dynamic. I think mm-hmm. I, I think having it all. You get the best of all the worlds, no matter what you do. Mm-hmm. So, just have fun with it, and I think that's where I'm at most of the time. Is I'm just having fun with it. Obviously, with all of that, I'm used to supporting all three of them, yeah. if you will. <laughs> um, yep. But in the end of the day, the the one I choose for myself to use is Linux desktop. Exactly. Um, I it just feels more comfortable to me, and that's that's where I gravitate to. Go where you're comfortable, though. Don't, don't, don't let someone on the internet uh, speak to you and say that you know you 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 need to use this. This is the thing to use. Don't do that. Don't do that. You tell me and Dan, we'll come and flex on those guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> we'll listen. We, we that guy uses Mac and it's fine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we we promote a a lot of what we choose, which is Linux. But right, I don't find fault in anyone for choosing something different. Absolutely. But if you got questions, come and ask. We I was going to say we could probably field them all, man. We 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 we'll be happy to we're answer gonna, and we're going to do it all. We'll give you the history behind it. Hey. hey. <laughs> that's that's why you come. That's what it is. So Johnny wrote in. Um he's one of our fantastic patrons. He said he gave a thumbs up to the mention of the desktop environments and how, you know, how often do we want to release that sort of thing? Um, Specifically, uh, my absolute favorite desktop of all time, XFCE. He dropped, uh, he dropped it. So he, he said, hi, I vote for quality over quantity. Talking about um, how often we, we release. release the history stuff. And then goes on to say, I also vote for Leo's favorite, the history of XFCE. And, you know, the open, the big smiley, smiley face. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so for, for those that may not know, uh, I don't. <laughs> XFCE <laughs> is not my absolute favorite. It's fine. No. Lots of people mm. love it. You please continue loving it. But it is not my favorite. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a cinnamon guy for the most part. Um, but I think that, that, that is, um, something that I would like to dig into. Mm-hmm. It is something I would like to figure out the history of because all of those desktops, especially Gnome and Plasma, KE mm-hmm. Plasma, are old. Mm-hmm. And man, the history of those things will stretch. So it would be fun to do. Um, Johnny, thanks for the feedback on mm-hmm. that because, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, you've just opened up a whole new wormhole for mm-hmm. me to fall into. So thanks. Mm. <laughs> I love it. So the next up is we've, we we got a um, little bit of feedback on one of the our YouTube videos. Actually, it was the last had, last YouTube video. Yeah, it was the the was Kali, Kali Linux, Linux history episode, uh, and it was uh, by Sigma. And my first thought was, ah, oh, cool, what a nice drive by comment uh, mm-hmm. from this person. Uh, all it said was nice content. And I said, you know, why thank you? <laughs> and but they followed it up. And th- this is this is what got me. And I haven't stopped thinking about this comment since it happened. And I don't know why. But they said, because I actually think it's super underrated. And I mean, not not a lot of things, but you know, the, the feedback tends to do this to me. But um this particular one, because it was just short and to the point, no embellishment, just yeah, here it is. This this is it. And man, thanks. That was that was just super nice. I I I appreciate that. Thanks. We we do it we do it for the community. We do it for us obviously because we enjoy doing it, but I mean, <clears throat> if there weren't listeners to hear it, mm-hmm. we would just be talking to ourselves and this could just be me and Dan hanging out on a Saturday night. Uh and Which would be fun too, know. but you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> But to know that uh, the folks that are listening to it or watching it on YouTube mm-hmm. are enjoying it too, man, I love yeah. it. 
I absolutely love it. So thank you so much, Sigma. Um, short and sweet, uh, still so good. So you want to have a topic covered or have some feedback? Uh, send us an email. Contact at linuxuserspace.show. We'll obviously talk about it. And it, you don't even have to send it there. You can just send it any any. Yeah, you yeah. You hit us anywhere. <laughs> if you're talking to us, it's fair game. <laughs> uh, as you can tell. <laughs> as you can tell, yes. Time for the first of the focus sessions. Okay, explain this to me. I'm ready. I'm going to do my best explanation that I can. Um, so community focus this time is someone that I don't necessarily think needs my endorsement. No. She has plenty of followers already, but there are a plethora of videos to go watch, um, I feel like. so. I f but I do feel compelled to inform the very few of you out there that watch this show um, that don't know about her. I'm talking about Veronica from Veronica Explains. So mm -hmm. Veronica mm -hmm. duh, is, is, is a Linux nerd. Uh, self-proclaimed um, and so she does a lot of different Linux content but like us I feel like uh, she's very supportive of the community interestingly she likes Vim too I, I like I like pretty much all of her content because she lives uh, where we live on the mm -hmm. positive side yeah. of computing and and I mean I, I I see enough negativity in my day mm -hmm. uh, that I don't need to bring it here, and I don't want to, you know, generally experience it outside of where I have to. So, I so so this is the kind of content that that I really 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 Same. really really enjoy. And what made me laugh recently was about a month ago. Uh, she uh, so the Pop OS thing and the mm -hmm. Rust thing and the desktop thing, and I'm very excited for that, by the way, uh, because I love the Pop Shell. And whenever you hit the the uh, super key, the thing that's basically Spotlight comes up, and oh man, so good. But anyway, <laughs> I digress. She starts talking about uh, is Pop OS falling apart? Obviously, it's not, but. Uh, in the thumbnail of the video for that one, she has a mug that I have. I have the same mug. Nice. And it says nope on it, N-O-P-E. And I mean, and she's sipping from it. And the, when that video came out, I was like, ah, the mug. Mm -hmm. I have that mug. So I had to watch, the obviously, I had to watch the video. Um, but she she does so much cool stuff. She does. Uh, she took a Commodore 64. Yes. like. Online to the mm -hmm. internet for mm -hmm. real. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, some of the retro stuff that she does is pretty fantastic too. Man, I am finding, mm -hmm. and and I think it's because of the history thing. I think it's because mm -hmm. I've been digging so much into the history that I'm finding that I've I'm falling in love with retro stuff. Like mm -hmm. I really want to go buy one of like the the Apple II, what Apple II E's or something. Like I mean, obviously they're super expensive, but you know, finding retro hardware like that and just tinkering with it modern day is interesting to say the very least. But she's got an educational side as well. She's yeah. got uh, QEMU KVM oh, yeah, for right. absolute beginners. Um, and uh, my, obviously, favorite distro, Linux Mint 21. She took the beta and installed it on, uh, it was like a 2012 or so Mac. Mm -hmm. And just brought that up. Man, ah, oh, ooh. So, she's talked about, uh, you, know, you know, recent Fedora releases. Um, yes. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I love the stuff that she talks about. Um, certainly like the retro stuff. I know one of the other, she, she's into keyboards too. And so she did, she, she got a new, <laughs> new to her, um, IBM keyboard. She took it all apart, got it all clean, put it all Was back. Was that the Model M Model one M, that she, yeah. yeah. Mm, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know, those things are built to last too, right? So. Oh, obviously 36 years old and it still works. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> so that was a great episode too. I, I just. Love all those things and a bunch of Linux stuff. And like you said, she's she's on the same side of positivity that we are. So check her out. That's Veronica Explains. She's got a YouTube. She's on Tilvids as well. Uh-oh. Yep. And and she's got a website too that's got some 
stuff. So I'll, I'll have links to those things in the show notes. Second focus. App focus. Got it. We got it. We got it. Pretty soon we're going to have another focus. I don't know what it's going to be. Maybe it's going to be feedback focus. <laughs> we're fairly know. focused on the feedback, so that makes sense. All right. So this focus is about Ed, the standard text editor. Wait, no. No, we've no. done that one. That's, that's, it's, that's in the past. It's <laughs> pass. Ah. The standard Unix password manager. Nice. So, I talked about it in the feedback, so now I can really get into it and and, and get really into uh, Pass itself, which I think is just endlessly interesting because you get to kind of see how the um, how the sausage is made, so to speak, right? Um, Pass follows the Unix philosophy, which is make each program do one thing well, and essentially there's a bunch of bits to that, but essentially it's just to keep things simple, right? Mm -hmm. um, and Pass is that it's dead simple if you kind of are comfortable in the command line. Of course, after you learn a few commands, right? Like you got to learn a little bit about how pass works. But let me tell you something. The man page does all the heavy lifting for you. There are examples of how to do everything mm. in the man page. This is probably one of the coolest man pages I've ever seen. Man pages for normal people. Nice. I mean, you already got to kind of be nerdy to be able to get into the man page of pass. But when you get there, if you're not wholly familiar with how the man pages actually work, don't worry. This is one of the easy ones. And yeah. I love it. You scroll down. Well, obviously, you see some of the options that you can do. That's normal man page stuff can kind of be overwhelming. But you scroll down a little bit. Examples of everything. Listen to that, we guys. Did, uh, Leo, yes. Leo just told you to read the manual. I did. Oh, I did it. I said I wasn't toxic. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good one, though. You really should. Like, yeah, I agree. <laughs> what, what I what this is what I think all man pages should be. I, I feel like some man pages uh, leave a little too much out. They, mm. they put a little too much onus on the on the user to really understand what's what's going on when you get in there. Mm -hmm. But pass does a little bit at the beginning. But if you if you if you're courageous enough to scroll down, you find that that man page is just fantastic. It, it gives you an example of pretty much everything that you would want to do with pass. So um, this, the man page itself, I think is probably the biggest impetus for it to be here. Um, cool. Because I, I think I want to show people a, an example of what I love about uh, well-written man pages. <laughs> nice. But, you know, also password management is cool too, right? We just talked about that. Absolutely. But, so uh, it's got examples of pretty much everything. So I, I didn't have to... Um, uh, Paul had mentioned in his feedback that there's a good primer on how to use pass, how to set it up, but you don't necessarily need it if you find the man page first because the man page goes over pretty much all of that. It, it's got how to initialize a password store, create um, passwords, um, how to where where the the password store is actually stored, how to move that around. It's got um, what I would expect to be in a blog post about an application is just right in the man nice. page. So I'd never thought I'd be on this show hyping up a man page, but here we are. Here we are. <laughs> 2022 is a weird year. So <laughs> uh, pass in it. That's all you got to do. And then name your store. And that's your store. It's where all your passwords are going to go. And you might be able to guess that pass generate would generate new passwords and you can stick them in folders by pass generate, like typing your folder name slash, just like, you know, Linux file system and then typing in the service name. So like if I wanted the password uh, to like Linux user spaces, YouTube, it would be pass generate less slash youtube.com. And then it would just boop, there's your password. You got a new one. I've stored it here. And I've spit out your password so you can do what you want to with it. But that kind of gave me the heebie-jeebies. I don't like my password being typed out nowhere. I don't mm -hmm. like that at all. Not that anybody's stealing my terminal output or anything like that, but shoulder surfers exist, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a long password. They're not going to get it. But still, um, you can do the dash C option, and that will not show your password on the command line, but immediately stick it into the clipboard Ooh. so that you can go use it 
So it's great. Like as you're setting something up, generate your password. It's immediately in your clipboard. You copy paste, copy paste into the confirm password box, right? Mm -hmm. And then go on about your day. The cool thing about it, 45 seconds is what you get. And it's removed from your clipboard. So you don't even have to go in like Bitwarden. You have to go turn that on. But in pass, it's on by default. Nice. And mm, mm, just ticking the boxes. This is why I waited because there's a whole lot of there's a whole lot of excitement about such a simple tool that yeah. I had to. And then you can you can decide the length of your password by just sticking a number at the end of the generate command. So I'm a fan of 16 or more. So you could just type in uh, pass generate dash c. And then whatever, whatever you, whatever uh, service, um, and then the number at the end of that could be 25. It doesn't matter. I, I usually double yours. I'm usually like 32 at least. Oh, you're a 32 kind of guy. I've run into a couple of situations where it was like, it must be lower than 24. And I'm like, that's a terrible policy. <laughs> mm, <laughs> yeah. That tells me something about their database backend and uh, it, it, maybe find a new service. It does, <laughs> and that gives me the heebie-jeebies too. So yes. you know that, and that is exactly why I use a password manager uh, because of services like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, cut that one down to twenty-four. But still, uh, it's just it's fantastic. And when you do want to reaccess your passwords, just type in pass, and then your whole password list not not of passwords, but of the things that you've stored passwords for uh, in tree form. As well, so you can have like nested folders and all kinds of cool stuff. Um, it'll all be there, pretty much the exact same way that you you deal with your Bitwarden. You got mm -hmm. folders and you got the lists and things, right? But oh, obviously in the terminal. And then uh, you'll just type in uh, pass, and then the service. But again, that'll spit out the password to the terminal. I don't like that. Just add dash c to it, so pass dash c the service, and it'll. Pop it to your clipboard so you can use it immediately. Hmm. Um, just absolutely great. And, and, you know, if you're trying to keep it simple, you can totally do that. It can only be on one machine. That is totally fine. But I think um, as, as we get more modern, you want to share that around. And you can do that. Uh, everything is encrypted with GPG. And you can just pass that, uh, pass the password store around as long as you keep a hold of that key. Um, right. <clears throat> but I think what a lot of people do, and what I think Pass was meant to do, as Paul had mentioned, is store your password, store and get. And because you are the only owner of that GPG key, it's fine to do something like that. Um, so stores the password, store and get. Anytime um, th there's a little bit extra initialization that you have to do but again guess what it's in the man page mm. it tells you exactly what to do explains what you're doing and gives you example output for what you're going to see so you know when it ran correctly mm -hmm. so just again I, I don't know why i'm hawking a man page but it's just it's a good man page you you add a couple extra um uh, arguments to your commands to 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 do the git stuff you obviously got to have a git repo in the first place um so there's a little bit of work on that end as well but when you have all that set up the cool thing about this is that git will remember the change history yeah. mm -hmm. so that when you make a catastrophic mistake eh no no big deal just go back a couple of uh, versions and yeah. you're all good yeah version control is a really good thing sometimes ah! Never thought I would say I need version control for my password store using a command line password utility. Yeah. So cool. Pass on the command line. I'm not gonna pass on that one. No, you shouldn't. Don't don't sleep on pass. Don't pass on pass. All right, Leo. That brings us all the way to next time. And Ooh, boy. I know. All the way down to the bottom of the list. Next time, we've got the history of Linux Lite, and uh, I know we, we bantered around different distros, and we were looking for one that doesn't have a lot of history, because we were looking to take it easy on ourselves, but I'm not sure you did that. <laughs> no. <laughs> nope. You know, because I, I, don't, I don't dig into these things uh, deeply uh, before I dive in. I'm just like, ah, oh, 10, 10, 15 years, that's not too bad. Hey, whoops. Yeah. Yep. But cool thing yep. is they just had a release. Um, and, uh, you know, I got some thoughts. Well, 
as as Johnny put it, um, XFCE is my favorite. Um, and that's what that's what uh, the default Linux Lite installation has. So it does. But you know what? I I will say this. Like normally, like if you just did XFCE out of the box, uh, like say Debian or something that doesn't have any theming or whatnot, um, it doesn't look so good. Okay. Yeah. Um, but this looks nice. They have some good theming applied. They do. I feel like, and uh, I love me some papyrus uh, icons. And those are there by default, so that's pretty cool. I do too. like those, man. Mm. I've I've used those on on Mint for quite a while, so it's gonna be good. Yeah, so that's good. Um, we'll give it that, plus a whole bunch of other thoughts that we've got that we're building. Um, I've got the a stack is like this at this point. It's it's getting big. Uh, in between shows, make sure to catch us uh, even on the the old Twitter bird site, um, or Mastodon. Telegram, Matrix, Discord, that's where you can give us the, the suggestions. Also on our subreddit. Um, and, and join the conversation so that we can, you know, have some ideas to talk about in these feedback shows. Mm-hmm. All the links are on our website, linuxuserspace.show. All right, Leo, where can we find you on the Internet? I can be found at Leo Chavez on Twitter and, of course, at Leo Chavez at Mastodon.social. And I'm at Casey2BEasy and at Casey2BEasy at Mastodon.social. Join us in two weeks when we return to the Linux user space. years ago today this is uh, asa dotzler 18 years ago today we shipped firefox 1.0 to the world well some of the world anyway i think we had something like 20 languages available then and thanks to vol- all thanks to volunteer i was deeply involved in the early firefox efforts and here is a bit of history from the early days so and that's just such a small little snippet and it's like 30 tweets or more there's probably more it was for firefox's 18th birthday right Mm-hmm. And it goes back before. I mean, was not, was, did not Mosaic turn into Netscape? Yeah, but, well, sort of. Not really. I want to say that they were, they were at least related in some way. And then Netscape went on for quite a while, and then turned into Phoenix, and then to Firefox. Mm-hmm. Man, what a crazy history that would be. I mean, that would be as big as the Ubuntu history, I have no doubt.